president of the Equine Welfare Alliance. He is a brilliant engineer, statistician, gatherer of information, and uh, he has, with his information, has helped to supply politicians, scientists, and people who are on our side to defend their position, and he does it brilliantly. He's the author of many studies, he's an author of books, but he's got a new study um, that is coming out just in time. It's going to be published within weeks, and it's going to refute the claims of the GAO report on slaughter, which was filled with holes, not fact-based, and um, somebody needed to do it, and if there was ever anyone to do it, it's John Holland. Thank you so much, Susan, and it's so, so great to be here. I, I came up the driveway here. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm with the Equine Welfare Alliance. We're an all-volunteer organization. We have several of our officials here today. Vicki Tobin uh, over here, who uh, if you get our alerts, she writes our alerts. Jeff Hudson over here, he, he does a huge amount of organizational work. And Joe Bunny, uh, who, is, who runs our Facebook, our, uh, our Facebook page and uh, also does a lot of the social media interaction, that kind of thing. Uh, she supports it, works very hard. I decided today to talk a little bit about the battle we are in because I think a lot of us have come in at different points in this battle. I've been in it for 10 years. It was going on long before I came, but I'll give you the 10 year synopsis because if we can understand where we've come from and what's happening right now, we can understand where we've got to go. Uh, it's, really, it's really a battle about what the American horse is. Uh, is it a disposable commodity that you just make money on and dump? And, that, and there are people that believe that. That's what the property rights issue is about. Which is kind of amazing that they use the property rights issue since uh, those of you who know history know that was the big issue in slavery. Yeah. Oh, it's property rights. I've got, you know, I own these people. Well, you know, do we really truly own animals in the same way that we own a car? And I don't believe we should, and I don't believe we do. Uh, it, so, so it's really a question of whether they're a disposable commodity or a trusting companion. I'll say a little bit of that at the very, about that at the very end. When I first got in this, I had an attorney friend. Uh, his name is Bill Mason. He's probably the most brilliant attorney I ever knew. He kept me out of jail uh, for, for 20 years when I was in business. He said, what are you doing? You know, you're going up against good lad in the newspaper. You know, you're getting yourself in a can of worms here. He says, this is just going to be awful. You don't know what you're up against because they're going to crush you. And uh, I, I said, well, you know, Bill, I've looked at this thing and I don't understand that. I said, you know, I see this, this horse slaughter industry is like maybe $100 million a year. You know, I, I, that's not even a big company. That's just a medium-sized company at best. I said, uh, it's really, a, you know, a Tapanoma Cecil. And... Uh, he said, you know, what's that? Anybody know the colloquial name for that? It's a piss ant. <laughs> I said, the industry is a piss ant. Now, how can they have any, any clout in Washington? They just don't have any, they don't make that much money. They don't have the clout. Well, what I didn't quite understand is that this little guy has, has a friend. Uh, and, and it's, it's Big Ag. And Big Ag is not always the brightest thing in the world because it often does things that are stupid for itself. But you don't want to come up against Big Ag and argue face on, you know, you, because it has a knee jerk reaction against anything that looks like it might somehow later come back as a slippery slope and hurt it. And they, the slippery slope in Washington is a religion. I mean, why else did the NRA come out against, uh, you know, ban on Teflon bullets? None of its members wanted a ban on, uh, care, you know, about a ban on Teflon bullets. They thought that was fine. They don't use Teflon bullets. They use Teflon bullets to shoot policemen. But they felt that they had to draw a line at, at any action at all. And, you know, if you could get the Teflon bullets, next thing it'll be caliber. You know, next thing it'll be something else. So, uh, it, Big Ag, this, you know, for some reason, uh, called its minions. Now, when we got our first bill in place, it was... Um, you know, almost, we really had a good opportunity because everybody looked at it at face value and said, horse slaughter, that's stupid, we shouldn't have that in America. Later, you know, the powers to be started spinning the story. 
So I, I thought, you know, somebody did this. I didn't do this. But somebody, somebody did this uh, block diagram, and, and, and I, I, I was going to explain it to you to show, you know, who, who, who all is interplaying here in the slaughter business. And I thought, no, these people will, will, will go to sleep on me, you know. What I need to do is get it down to a metaphor. I like metaphors. So I decided, you know, a swamp was a better metaphor. Uh, the, you know, if you look at a swamp, it, it first, well, it smells similarly, for, that, for one thing, you know. And, and if you look at a, at a swamp at face value, it doesn't seem to be much happening. You have to study it for a little while, and then you see there are things under the surface. Now, these two are basically the same guy, a a AQHA and Rodeo there. Uh, you know, the AQHA, American Quarter Horse Association, is the biggest breed organization. And in fairness, it's the, it's the biggest breed in the United States. About 70% of the horses that go to slaughter uh, are quarter horses. The AQHA pays lobbyists to defend slaughter. They have decided that that's their business model, disposable business model. Um, th their management has done a really wonderful job. They've lost about 50% of their revenues in the last seven years. They are they're going down the tubes. Their breed registry is going down. And what do they do? They hire more lobbyists because, you know, they must not be doing enough of it. <laughs> it's the problems the AKHA have are, are very, in my opinion, are, are very systemic. They have allowed what happens to a lot of breeds when they become popular. People begin breeding them, breeding too many of them for, for a distinct quality. Like uh, if you remember years ago, the collies were bred for a narrow head. Pretty soon they didn't cast a shadow. Because, you know, and, and so it affected the breed badly. Uh, the AQHA is breeding for who wins in a quick turn and a quick acceleration. Well, for a quick turn and a quick acceleration, you need a light hoof. So your winners start keep having lighter and lighter hooves. Now they don't have any hoof. And you can ask anybody in, in, that's into quarter horses. Now, I love quarter horses. You know, some of my best friends are quarter horses, literally. But it, people are going to come at me. You, you know, you're disparaging a wonderful breed. It is a wonderful breed. But it's not being helped by the AQHA. The AQHA is enabling it, the breeders, to take it down the tubes. Uh, the breeders? That's, that's, they're in the swamp there. The kill buyers, of course. We know those wonderful people. They're the ones that clean up the garbage, as they will tell you. And, of course, the auctions, which are wonderful places like uh, uh, Sky McNeil, the lady that pushed the Oklahoma bill, you know. Her wonderful auction supplies a valuable service, and yeah. you know they just. What was really amazing, and I'm talking about agriculture doing stupid things. They just overturned a 1960s law against slaughtering horses in Oklahoma, and the Farm Bureau came out and overturned it. We've got to overturn this. Do you know whose law it originally was? The Farm Bureau's. Do you know why the Farm Bureau originally passed it? Because people were selling horse meat as beef, and the cattlemen said we can't have this. And the cattlemen passed the law, and now the cattlemen forgot that, while Europe is doing exactly the same thing that happened before. It is pretty insane. Like I say, Big Egg is powerful, and you don't want to get his way, but it's not always bright. Uh, racing, of course. Now, that's not just thoroughbreds. Everybody blames thoroughbreds. They probably have, have at least studied and tried to do something. Uh, I know Susan it gets rather tired of hearing the stories in her ear, and then nothing much happens, but they actually have tried. Uh, the quarter horse people that say, in your face, we, you know, we're going to slaughter horses and, you know, we don't care what you think. And a lot of the rodeo people say, yeah, 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 you know, we don't care. So, uh, and then you've got the quarter horse racing, short track racing, very popular. And, of course, the slaughterhouses themselves. So that's, that's the people that make money off slaughter. Uh, who's in charge? Well, if you look real close, uh, that's Charlie Stenholm. We'll learn a little more about Charlie soon. <laughs> And I know y'all are out there saying, well, where's Sue Wallace and Dave Duquette, you know? Uh, I mean, aren't they in charge? I mean, they're, they're important, aren't they? And if you, if you look down along the bottom there, the bubbles, you'll see they're, they're actually like Sue and Dave uh, uh, down there in the bottom. They didn't surface because it was lunch. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm playing to my base here. <laughs> Anyhow, so how important, this is one of my favorite slides, how important is this, this money to the horse industry? Deloitte did a great study a few years ago for the American Horse Council, and they found that it was a $102 billion industry indirectly, and $39 billion directly for American horses. They found about 9 million horses, you've heard that number, 
And guess what? Uh, the uh, the amount that goes uh, of each dollar, each hundred dollars that's earned, which I've shown here in stacks, that that comes from slaughter. That's how much of it we get from the slaughter. It's three cents. Three cents of every hundred dollars, and we kill the horses for it. Judas did a lot better. He had a much better bargain, you know. Three cents. That's what we what we get for 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 betraying these animals, and for making a disgusting mockery of ourselves. Okay, what was the strategy of the slaughter of uh, the slaughter industry? Well, the first thing they did, they needed gatekeepers, and the first gatekeeper that I'm aware of was Bob Goodlap. We'll talk about him in a second. And these guys are are already placed in key places. It's the same way with the AVMA and the AAEP. They the agriculture people get these folks push them into higher positions, urge them forward, help them get into these positions, and then later when they need the AAEP or the AVMA to say something, they can say, yeah, we think, you know, burning kittens is nice. I mean, whatever they want, the, the, the people in power will say because they were pushed there by the, the magical hand of the lobbyists and the, and the power brokers in Washington. I know that sounds cynical, but I believe uh, every word I'm saying. And I'll, and I'll testify to that in court when I'm sued. <laughs> Uh, now they, the second thing they do is they develop talking points and they repeat them endlessly. We've heard all the talking points and we've heard them repeated endlessly. Mm -hmm. And they use front organizations. Now, one of, some people were talking about the Unwanted Horse, Horse Coalition. And it has actually begun to do some real things. But only, when it was formed, its only job was to identify the slaughter horse as an unwanted horse. Mm -hmm. That was the reason it was formed. To say, yes, these, we're slaughtering unwanted horses. And they repeated that message endlessly until many, many people just said, yo, they're unwanted. They didn't think where they really came from. Then, believe it or not, they actually had a policy of, feeding, of filling the media with false abandonment stories. Now, this is so brazen that you can't believe it. Uh, I actually have the email from the director of communications for the AVMA to all AVMA members saying, now that they have stopped slaughter in the United States, we need stories. We need stories about increases, not whether or not it increased, but increases in abandonment and abuse and neglect. Get us these stories. So stories started coming out. First one was uh, the college basketball stringer Jeff McMurray in, in uh, Kentucky. Uh, he talked about packs of horses. I mean, he was an expert. <laughs> packs of horses roaming the mountains of, 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 of reclaimed strip mines. And uh, how that was due to the fact that the slaughter plants had been forced to close. He wrote it two weeks after the first plant closed. Two weeks. Those horses have been up there for decades. And the funny thing was, AP took the story and went out with it. And they put it online and then turned around and found out that that they had put a story out two weeks earlier about the same horses, and it identified where the horses came from. They were from a Brakes riding stable in Brakes, Virginia. So could we get it retracted? No, the paper that put it out would not retract it. Then uh, Cockle, and, they, and these are good newspapers, Oregonian, wrote an article about uh, abandoned horses being a big problem on the farm of a McKinsey when we actually called Mr. McKinsey, he wouldn't answer the phone. So we looked at the, at the police officer, it was an uh, under sheriff wolf, who had, had uh, been cited in the article as saying we can't figure out where these horses are coming from because they don't have any brands. So we called him and he said, what horses? He says, I don't know any horses. So he looked up the records and found out that they had been called out for one horse being cited by McKinsey's granddaughter, who thought she saw a horse but they couldn't find the horse. <laughs> That became nine horses running all over his property, eating everything in sight. One story after another had been falsified and put out very often on large media. Uh, it was, it's, you know, when you think about it for a minute, what does that mean for us about other stories we read in the press? And then you call the Oregonian and you say, here are the police reports for the last five years. There were, there were exactly three horses uh, found and two of them were already dead. You know, and none of them were the, horse you're, the horses you're talking about in five years. And they say, we're sticking with our story. That's all they would tell us. They're sticking with their story. So then they lost credibility. We actually, if you go back and you, I go back and I look for those original articles online, 
and I type in keywords to find the article, and more often than not, I find our rebuttal to the article. <laughs> our rebuttals are actually linked more times than the actual articles. So they needed something to gain credibility. They, they, they're really fighting you know, a, a um, counterattack uh, against us stopping the inspections. They went to the GAO. Well, a small congressional group went to the GAO, and I talked to the GAO committee, a guy named Horner on the committee, and I didn't like what I was hearing. I, I sensed that we were being set up. And two months before his long-awaited report came out, I said, how are you going, you know, I, I sense that you're going to tell us that closing these plants had a negative impact on the horse industry. And he says, well, you've got a problem with that. And I said, yeah, you know, slaughter didn't diminish. Slaughter is just as high as ever. And he said, can you prove that? <laughs> the man has studied for two years and hadn't seen the slaughter numbers yet. So I sent him spreadsheets with the slaughter numbers on it. He said, where did you get these? I said, from you. I said, the government, you know. And it was pretty mind-blowing, you know. Uh, so, but they have successfully driven that report home. Now, we'll talk a little bit about that report in a minute. Okay, they're going to leverage the, the report to get the reinstatement of the inspections. They did that successfully. And if you read the articles, like you'll see many articles written about this, the GAO found a 60% increase and horse abuse and neglect because of the closing of slaughter plants. No, the GAO didn't even say that. The GAO said, you know, Montana has seen a 60% increase since the plants were closed. Those of us who are engineers know that is not because the plants closed. They didn't say because the plants closed, but people read it the way they intended it to be read. And finally, they're going to introduce legislation in the agricultural states where they can be most successful. That's why they were out in Oklahoma. Now, I want to give you a brief history of gatekeepers. Uh, the first and most heroic of all of them was my friend Bob Goodlatte, and he got me into all this because I knew him, and people said, you've got to talk to Bob. We have got enough votes in his ag committee to pass this, in his ag committee, and say nothing of the House. We had 230 co-sponsors. We had senators and, 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 and really powerful pro uh, people in Congress, you know, Byrd, Ensign, Stevens, uh, Kennedy, uh, all of them were on our side. It was a no-brainer. We were just going to cruise right through. But then the heroic stance of, of Bob Goodlatte. That's, a, that's, a, that's an artist recreation, I'll admit. But, you know, he's, a, he's at the gates of the Ag Committee saying, this bill shall not pass. You notice he's got his pin on, though. Uh, Bob, Bob uh, and I kind of, uh, our friendship didn't go as far as it really uh, it might have otherwise. We, we kind of ended up at odds with each other. The next uh, gatekeeper, you may recall, was uh, a senator. Uh, he uh, made it, he had a really broad stance on the issue. <laughs> we began to notice a pattern uh, with him uh, because it, it, he did not come out as a big slaughter advocate until the little incident in the restaurant. All of a sudden now, he's a big, you know, anti-slaughter advocate. He was really going to defend slaughter. Um, uh, I'm sorry, slaughter advocate, not anti-slaughter advocate. <laughs> Anyhow, so then we started to see something uh, of a pattern, and uh, all of a sudden, one day, Max Baucus started making really loud and aggressive noises about how good slaughter was. And uh, I wrote an article, because I did a little research, and I found out that he had had a slight problem because he got up on the Senate floor drunk as a skunk and was falling down drunk, literally. I mean, you can see it yourself on YouTube. And slurring his words and making a speech about how all the evil people fought him on some bill. Anyhow, I found that very interesting because it immediately got on YouTube. Now, the mainstream media didn't make a big thing of it. But I recognized immediately he was poisoned. He could not run again. Because that YouTube video would just show up in political ads. It's just the man you want, you know? And there he is, oh, I'm going to do, and you know, it's kind of, it was really wild. It was quite a speech. And uh, so, you know, uh, I wrote this article, uh, Max Baucus uh, Walks the Horse Slaughter Plank. Now, some people took offense to that. I caught a lot of heat, you know, oh no. You know, but I said, they're making him walk the horse slaughter plank because, uh, 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 the, and he will never be able to run for another term. And they said, oh no, he's going to be around for a long time. Well, this week we heard he's not going to be around for a long time. Yeah, uh, that is actually a picture of his face during the Senate speech. 
Yeah. Yeah, he, he, I think it's the point in the speech where he realized that he had just ruined his career. <laughs> Anyhow, pro slaughter talking points. Call slaughter uh, horses unwanted. Talk about old, lame, and dangerous horses, despite the fact that Victoria showed us that they are all young, and, and we know they're not. Claim that slaughter prevents abuse and neglect. That's their biggest one. That's their ace in the hole. They're absolutely convinced <laughs> of that. Claim the ban has made things worse. And quote ban because we actually slaughter as many horses as ever. Uh, call uh, harvesting, uh, a slaughter harvesting or euthanasia, which it's neither. Now harvesting I loved. Um, claim there's no place to bury horses. Now that's the dumbest one of all, and I'll, I'll hit a little more on that in a minute, but that one has, uh, has actually been used again in the last month or so. I thought it had died. Okay, and talk about uh, feeding horse meat to the starving and needy of the world. <laughs> and finally, warn on infringement of property rights, and we already discussed that. Our strategy has been to do what we could do. And that was to investigate and document every aspect of horse slaughter. So when an article comes out, we go and see if it's true. And it usually isn't. Uh, we collected all kinds of data with the help of people like Paula Bacon, who's here, and you'll be hearing from her tomorrow, I believe. Uh, and uh, we, we got people in Illinois to collect all the data on, I mean, these are, cor these are records of, of the uh, sewage discharge of the plant. Uh, we, we got people uh, in uh, Canada, who the Canadian Horse Defense Coalition, who got into the plants and documented a lot of stuff, and they they actually got video footage of a tanker truck driving out of the plant and driving down to the river and pouring blood into the river. Uh, you know, we, we so we document a lot of that, and we research all factors bearing on a horse care because you never know what you're going to turn up. You have to understand the whole world, the whole thing from top to bottom. <coughs> and we uh, investigated and countered, the, of course, the false media stories, as I said before. We warn horse meat consumers about health issues. Uh, I think Vicki will tell you that we've been on that one for about four or five years. We were uh, originally fought a little bit by some of the older organizations that were around. They said, oh, we tried that and it didn't work. And we said, no, this is, it's, first of all, it's a very real threat. And, and, and secondly, you know, it's our, our ice in the hole. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet Dr. Marini, who you'll be hearing from, uh, I think, right after lunch. And I said, is it possible that they, they could, the boot could not be dangerous in horses? You know, I know, I give it to my horses. And she started researching, and the more she researched, the, 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 the more interesting it became. And then she wrote, uh, really, a seminal paper on it. And that's just one drug. That doesn't include frog juice. <laughs> Which I happen to like a lot, you know, as an alternative. But <laughs> uh, the other thing was to warn communities about what this does to their community. It, it increases crime, it increases pollution, it has just terrible impacts on and the smell. I mean, I've been in, in, in Kaufman uh, and, and s smelled the, the odor to which the Boggy Bottom neighborhood was subjected. In fact, the, uh, uh, Paul will tell you that the hospital had to put special uh, air filtration in. Uh, so we actually get out, we find out where solar plant's going, and we try to warn people. Now, some of them don't want to hear it. You know, but we warn them. And the other thing is we have to earn the media trust. When they have a tendency to think of animal welfare people. We are not animal rights people. I don't know what that is either. We're animal welfare people. We, they have a tendency to think of us as emotional, um, not fact-driven, not practical. And we have to, to earn their trust. When we send them data, they have to find out it's true. And finally, we have to educate grassroots volunteers to become active and good at all of this. They have to be as good as we are. And now I'm really proud to say that whenever an article comes out, the Pro Slaughter article comes out, if you will look at the comments after it, our folks are nailing them. They know all of these facts. They know where they came from. They know the source, the data. You know, they, they are nailing them. You can't write a Pro Slaughter article and not expect that the blog, in fact, most of them now don't have a blog at the end because they know what's going to be on it. Now, this, uh, the, one of the things that got me interested early on was did slaughter really reduce abuse? Uh, the blue line you see here were the number of cases of abuse and neglect in Illinois, and the, uh, the purplish line is a, uh, the total uh, horse slaughter in the country. The reason I got involved in this is that Bob Goodlatte went to a meeting, at, uh, he held a town hall meeting, and we had about 150 people there to, to bombard him. Sheila was there, she can tell you, it was quite experienced. He held up his Blackberry and he said, I have absolute proof, you know, that when the slaughter plant in Illinois is closed, you know, uh, the abuse and neglect 
uh, doubled in the next three years. I said, would you please have your aide send that to me? He sent me a very condescending letter. You can see this is absolutely strong. This is from, you know, Department of Illinois Department of Agriculture. It was this increase right here he was talking about. And you see that starts in 2000 and ends in 2002. And uh, then I found him at a fundraiser and I walked up and I said, Bob, I got some, some news for you. I said, you know, the plant didn't burn in 2000. It burned in 2002. And I handed him an article. And I said, now, does this change your opinion, you know, of, of your previous statement? And he said, uh, I disagree with your interpretation of the statistics. <laughs> now, two things about this chart. You'll notice that the upward trend on both lines, that means that slaughter was generally going up and abuse and neglect was generally going up. That shouldn't happen. If slaughter went generally up, abuse and neglect should have gone generally down. Not only that, the individual changes, the sun increase. Uh, here in the number of cases should have been due to a sun drop starting about here in, in the amount of slaughter, but it wasn't. And I ran statistical analysis and the two just frankly aren't linked at all. But in a later study, I, I said, what if I look at unemployment? And I looked at unemployment in Illinois and look at that. Two spikes. Now, you might say, well, what's the downward trend? You've got to understand that unemployment really was going down uh, I mean, it was not going flat there, it was simply uh, the, uh, the fact that people go off the rolls after a certain period of time. But the two upward spikes coincide almost perfectly. Unemployment goes up, abuse and neglect goes up. Makes a lot of sense. And so, what would happen in 2008 that, you know, that might cause abuse and neglect to go up? I can't remember, did we have a recession or something in 2008? Yes, we did, you know. We had the biggest one known, and that's exactly what you would expect from that recession would be an increase in abuse and neglect. Now, sometimes, you know, I, I have to give up the charts and poke a little fun. Some things you just can't put in a chart. Uh, so, you know, let's look at horse harvesting, you know. We wanted to know what would horse harvesting look like, so we put out this, uh, this picture of what horse harvesting would look like. That's all you have to say about horse harvesting. <laughs> now, here was one of my absolute favorites. Bob Goodlatte put this out. This is still online. You can find this. It was about a one-page uh, press release about why he, he uh, uh, was defending horse slaughter. And that release said, men's dogs and cats are humanely euthanized each year, but disposal of unwanted uh, horses is not as simple as that on unwanted cats and dogs. He really said this. He said, it's illegal in many states to bury horses because they're uh, vectors for West Nile virus. Now, who can think of a problem with this statement? First of all, there's no state that has, where it's illegal to bury a horse at all. Now, there's areas where the water table's high, you can't bury anything, but there's no pro prohibition on horses. Secondly, you know, the, the horse is not a vector. The vector bites things, you know. The, the mosquitoes are the vector, you know. And, and so I thought, well, you know, th there is a way that maybe this could be true. Uh, it would require very large mosquitoes. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and so if this, if you look out back and you see this, you'll know Bob was warned you. He warned you. you know. <laughs> now, 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 bear in mind, this is the head of the Agriculture Committee. <laughs> the Agriculture Committee. Oh. Oh, Need I say more? <laughs> Now, sometimes we get a little more serious, uh, and sometimes we find that the enemy gives us the best information. Uh, and by enemy here, I'm saying, uh, we found a Temple Grandin study where she, early on in her career, looked at horses arriving at slaughter plants. She studied about 1,024 horses, I think it was, and she categorized them. How many of them were healthy and, and, and no problems at all, and how many of them had any, any issues at all? And you can see, this is where the 94% healthy, good, good horses comes from. Uh, the, the remainder, about half of those were just skinny. A little food would take care of that. Now, they can't really argue this because she's one of their heroes. You know, she invented the humane uh, system of slaughtering cattle that keeps the stress down in cattle. But she's kind of, she's tried to do humane horse slaughter and it hadn't worked too well. Uh, if you all recall the undercover video that our friends in Canada released that showed a 
a poor draft horse being hit 11 times with a stun gun. And he staggered to his feet and he shook and he just couldn't understand what was happening and they hit him again. Finally, the guy leaves, he gets a bigger gun, and comes back and hits him two or three more times to finally put him down. And I asked her, I said, you know, how can you not be critical of that? She said, oh, the first one killed him. And she said, those were just involuntary reactions they were making sure. I said, involuntary reactions? You've got to be kidding me. I never talked to her again. I said, if you're going to tell me something like that, then you think I'm really stupid. You know, I mean, I'm sorry. There's no good way to put it. Now, the GAO report. The GAO report is, oh, God, it's a, a huge, you've got to read it. You know, I mean, uh, you've got to read it. It is schizoid. And one of the reasons it's schizoid uh, and, and uh, is that, you know, I told you that I didn't warn him until two months before the, the thing had to come out. So he'd already written all these problems that the ban on horse slaughter was causing. And now he was faced with the fact that there wasn't any reduction in slaughter. So he had the word around it because he, he had instructions, I'm convinced, or he had convinced himself that really the ban was bad and that we had to get rid of it. So the first paragraph says, since domestic... Uh, uh, slaughter season in 2007 and shifted to Canada and Mexico from 2006 to 2010. U.S. horses like blah, blah, blah. It's basically said as uh, slaughter had unchanged. It, 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 it has not changed at all. It's just the same old thing, same number of horses being slaughtered. We only change where they're being slaughtered. First paragraph. Reasonable. Okay, now, this chart shows exactly that. This, I sent him this chart. You can see that the, the Canada and, and Mexico, for the most part here, made up for American slaughter. America's a red. Uh, it made up for the American slaughter very quickly right after the plants closed. So what chart does he put out in his study? He puts out the red part. Slaughter goes to zero, you know, in 2007. He does not put out the... And then they put in another chart somewhere else, you know, the Mexican slaughter going up and the Canadian slaughter going up. But the point was, he pulled it apart so you couldn't compare them directly. You couldn't see that slaughter basically didn't change. If you look at the average for this period and this period, they're the same, almost to the horse. So, what does he say in the second paragraph? State, local, tribal, and, and horse industry officials, these are officials, these aren't us ragtag people, <laughs> generally attribute these increases in abuse and neglect to cessation of domestic slaughter and the economic downturn. Now, why would they maybe, they just read 2,000 false articles, you know, maybe that would influence. I said to him, do you realize if you just ask people their opinion instead of studying this and getting numbers, that they're going to tell you what they read in the paper? And that's, what, that's the whole idea. He said, I'd never do that. So here he says, you know, basically these people, uh, you know, believe it's mostly due to the cessation of domestic slaughter. The mechanism for which it was to do, he doesn't put it here. There's no mechanism. There's no way. Okay. And then others, including, we're just representatives, we're representatives of some, some animal welfare organization, question the relevance of the cessation of slaughter to these problems. Do you notice anything in the wording down here? Now, it's the cessation of slaughter, not the cessation of domestic slaughter. The whole report is skewed this way. If you pick it up anywhere, you will find this nonsense. The only thing they did of any statistical value at all was they went out to the auctions and they looked at horse prices and how much they had dropped. And this is probably honest data. Horse prices had dropped about $100 across the board a little more. And then they did an amazing <coughs> bit of mathematics. They used regression analysis. Why regression analysis? Because that will scare anybody from even asking. Most people don't want to ask and look stupid. You know, what is regression analysis? They plugged in a dummy variable for our, where are we slaughtering horses during this uh, in America or, or Mexico? And the dummy variable came back and said, yeah, you know, when you do it in Mexico, it's, it's, uh, the value goes down. Why? Because the same time frame that we were uh, moving slaughter to Mexico and Canada, we were also uh, having the hell of a recession. So I decided to check into that to see if there might be some other reason. And I said, could you please send me the data and the calculations because we had a PhD economics professor uh, who wanted to look at them. She thought this couldn't be, it's impossible. And what did they send me back? The, the GAO will not release that to you because the congressional requesters said that it can't be released in Congress is not subject to the uh, Freedom of Information Act. Now, does this strike anybody as not passing a smell test? 
Does that not strike you as, there's only, I mean, this wasn't national defense. This wasn't a guidance system for a cruise missile. You know, the, this is a, a study on which we are basing policy in Washington, and we can't know how they did the calculations because they don't think it's appropriate for us to know. Mm -hmm. You know, because somebody would pull it apart in a heartbeat. So I started studying what other things were, were going on, and I'm real pleased to announce at the end of, the, of this coming month, this paper will be in, in the Kentucky uh, Journal of Equine Nat uh, Agriculture and Natural Resources Law, and it's a peer-reviewed paper. Now, for those of you who know what a peer-reviewed paper is, they, you know, you say, and so when the sun comes up tomorrow, and the editor comes back and says, "Do you have any proof the sun will come up tomorrow?" And you know, you have to you have to put a disclosure in there. Past performance is no indication of future performance. Uh, it's just it's one of those things when you're peer-reviewed, you have to actually document every statement of fact in the paper. You have to give a link, and the thing is absolutely chock about full of, of, uh, of uh, footnotes. Now. Laura Allen was good enough to write the legal section for me about the whole process by which slaughter got where it is now. And uh, I wrote the study. And you saw the beginnings of this last year, if you were here. It all started because I saw an article that said uh, that the dairymen were, were having a hard time getting alfalfa. And they were blaming exports because the federal government was encouraging exports to China and uh, to Japan and to South Korea and, and some other places. Well, I decided to look into it, and sure enough, you know, the USDA keeps really nice databases. And I charted it, and look at what's happening. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, the amount of alfalfa produced is dropping every year. Now, alfalfa, out here we don't use alfalfa to feed horses as much as they do in the West. In the West, it's, it's what you feed horses. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the culture, but it is a hay. And it, it links to the, the availability of hay. And you see hay, while somewhat more <coughs> rough, it's taking the same trend down. Now, the available after exports is because this is how much we were actually exporting. Mm -hmm. So the, the dairymen were all concerned about this and didn't notice this. <laughs> In other words, the biggest drop was, the huge drop was due to uh, the fact that, that land allocation was changing. And if you look at the, at the price of hay, now guess what happened? Hay prices skyrocketed after 2007, mostly due to the cessation of domestic slaughter. <laughs> right. <laughs> Guess what? This is, this is hitting us really hard as horse owners. Why did that change? Look at the use of corn in ethanol. Look at it. Look at its spike. Okay, it was also caused by the slaughter plants closing. Uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And this is due, of course, to the fact that we were subsidizing it, and, and finally, at some point, the subsidy plus the, the price of it was cheaper than gas. And then all of a sudden, all the producers wanted to stick it in the gas. Before then, you had to force them to. And talking about gas, it's gone up a little bit. Who uses the most gas? To, you know, a, a, a commuter with a Kia or, you know, one of us with a dually. Yeah, we use a lot of gas and it hurts us. So I took all the stress factors, including unemployment, and I plotted them. And you'd be amazed at how many things have been impacted by the closing of domestic slaughter. You know, we're, we're, we're being killed. Now, what did, the G, what did the GAO report say about this? The word hay did not appear in the GAO report. Didn't appear. Cost of fuel was only mentioned for kill buyers driving to Mexico, because it cost them more. And they claimed that all of the drop was because kill buyers couldn't pay as much, because they had a long drive, and they had to, to uh, pay less at auction. Well, I'm sorry, anybody that knows an auction, you can't go in an auction and say, excuse me, I'm going to bid $100 less and get this horse because I got high costs. No, you get the horse because the other guy has high costs. He can't pay as much. So. Who was the other guy at the auctions? The other guy was the, uh, the buyer uh, for other purposes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe rehabilitation horses, mostly uh, for, for riding horses and for recreational horses. So this became obvious to me. Now what was really interesting is I, you, sometimes I told you, you your enemies <laughs> contribute to your, the, the ABMA does some pretty good little studies from time to time. And they're not quite 
smart enough sometimes, or something, or not attentive enough is a better word, to notice that they're actually feeding us exactly what we need. They found that horse ownership had dropped 16.7% during uh, this period, basically. That means that it was the, the owners that didn't go to the auction and buy horses to replace their dying horses. If a horse gets past 10 years of age, by the way, his chances of going to slaughter are nil. The way he will die, he may die of abuse and neglect, he may be left out in the field, he may be, uh, you know, uh, not treated for disease, but he usually won't go to slaughter. So that, uh, we found that while doing the additional work for this paper. We also found that an American Horse Publications survey that was very interesting noticed that 23% of the owners had less than $50,000 in income, 65% less than 100000 we are, as, as horse owners, recreational horse owners in America are not rich people. And what else was very interesting in the same survey, what did they say was their reason? They said they, the largest reason was the cost of feed and second fuel, third, third veterinary care. And that's exactly what we predicted from the source data that we looked at. So this report is, is an antidote for the GAO. I intend to go to the GAO once this actually is out in print and ask them formally to retract their article. That, that it was flawed and needs to be taken off. If they don't do it, we will, we will punish them. What's really interesting about this law journal is I, I was attracted to it because it had a little blog article about how necessary slaughter was. And I sent them the study. And I thought, oh, they, you know, they won't want to publish it. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about publishing it. And then when we, when we got it worked up, what was amazing is they sent me back just a few corrections. And one of them was, your title's too weak. The title was Factors that Influence the, the Horse Ownership or whatever. And they said, oh, no, you see, you need to put in there as part of your title why slaughter isn't the answer. And I almost fell off my chair. I was, I was all prepared for them to, you know, to push back on me on a lot of issues. We need to understand what's happening right now. Um, these are the number of foals registered in the United States. This is put together by a jockey club. They do a lot of good statistical research, but it's only every few years that they do it. And you'll notice that this is slaughter. Uh, back in the early 90s, we were slaughtering more than we were producing. Um, that condition has happened again out here now uh, by 2012. The, the uh, number of foals being registered has dropped below the number we're slaughtering. Now, granted, there are a lot of unregistered horses, but it's a good indicator. And what happens when that happens is slaughter can't find the cheap horses anymore. And they're running out right now. Now, to look at a, a little bit more, this is, I'm getting almost done, so you, you folks are ready for lunch. Can, <laughs> they can have a break here to say. I thought it'd be interesting to look at what's happening. If you've noticed in that little bar chart, Canada was actually lower last year. It had dropped about 7%, but Mexico had increased drastically. They made up all the increase. And I'm saying, why do we not send them to Canada to go to Europe, and we are sending them to Mexico to go to Europe. And then I found a little fact. Canada tests for butte. Mexico does not test for butte. And I asked the EU, they don't even require you to make a statement about butte, and they say butte is, is exempt. And I, and I went to the EU and I said, you know, how can you take the meat from Mexico? And they said, I assure you that the Mexican plants meet all our requirements. That's all they would say. They wouldn't answer it. Um, so, look at the last two years. This was 2011 going up and up and up, and up and up and up and up and up. And this is this year. Now, this spike right here took us by surprise. But otherwise, this year has been a continuous decline. What does that tell me? It tells me that the chances are that most of the meat was, we were trying to figure this out for a long time because we look at, at numbers from Europe and they say horse meat consumption is going down. And then we look at our exports and they're going up. Well, you know, they, on the way over they turned into beef. <laughs> and, and that's the only thing you can conclude there. Now, this spike, this spike went up to 2,500 horses a week. This week, I got by telephone the fact that it's now dropped down to about here. So it's about, at this point, it's still awfully high. The question is, what will it do in the weeks to come? So, you know, that brings us full circle back to disposable commodity or 
trusting companion. Now, I picked those words very carefully. I thought of a lot of different words, partner, companion, and so forth. But the main operative word is trusting. What haunts me and what drives me into this is the fact that I know horses. I know how sentient they are. I've been around them all my life. I know they have friends. They have enemies. They have jealousy. They have all kinds of attributes. Some of them good. Some of them not so good. Most of them quite good. And they're, they're, but I also know that they trust us. And they give us anything. They, they earn that big pile of money for us. And then for that three cents, we, we send them up a slaughter chute. And when they get near the, that slaughter chute, they probably when they're unloaded, it has to dawn on them that they have been betrayed. Now, can imagine multiplying that sense of betrayal. Now, you might say, well, they're not that smart. Well, they're smarter than, than, than you know, a, a one-year-old baby. You know, the, the people put them, I don't know, what, what is this accepted... A human age for intellect is, but it's so uh, it's it's in the several years of childhood uh, for an adult horse. So it, it's not quite uh, a valid con uh, uh, comparison, but still, they are bound to understand that they have been betrayed and that they're going to die for no reason. Mm -hmm. And you multiply that times 165,000 times a year, and that's what keeps me up at night. That's what keeps me doing this.